Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. This is a test of the video game broadcast system. This is only a test. What were you doing in October of 1982? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to play some video games. We were last checking out Monster Maze on both the Atari home computer and the VIC-20. Let's see what is next. More and more games on the Commodore VIC-20. Next up is the Moons of Jupiter. Let's see what's up. Starting with the box. Oh my goodness, it's another one by Romic Software. I'm familiar with this box. This is the fifth game we've seen by this company. Pretty standard as far as the front of the box goes. And I think every single one of these by Romic always asks, will you be the Supreme World Champion? I don't know, that's a pretty stiff title. We'll, we'll see what happens when we, when we pop in the game to play. We're the commander of a fleet of destroyers looking on an alien mothership. You're sent one destroyer at a time to blast passage through the moons of Jupiter. We have to destroy, looks like they call them uh, asteroids and UFOs. It calls it a real action shot of a game. There's another shot of the cassette case, not necessarily the box of the game. And then there's the cassette tape we're going to pop in the play. That's right, cassette tapes are what's powering our video games right now in October 1982, at least on most home micros. And there's an example of the screenshot. That's all we have. We have an alternate version that you could have been playing. Oh, we have the 3K version or the 8K, which means you can't use an unexpanded VIC-20 to play this. You have to buy the memory. So let's say we just shelled out the most and we're going to play the 8K version. Ready? And let's pop it in play. This is by Dave Burden, published by Romic Software at some time in the beginning of October 1982 or the beginning of the fourth quarter of 1982. Your destroyers have to dodge and blast the UFOs. Watch out for the gol gol Gologs. They could smash your destroyers. You cannot harm them. So maybe there was a little bit of lore on the inside sleeve that nobody has scanned yet on the internet. There's our controls if you use keyboard. We have our joystick plugged in on the VIC-20 to play and with point values for different meteors to blow up as, as well as the UFO. Got it. Very nice. All right, let's see put us in. So this is awesome. This is one of those games that whenever you pop in for the home, home computer, you don't need to use the keyboard. I only use the controller. Push the, the button on your joystick and you're ready to go. And we're, we're also ready to die. <laughs> really, really fast. So you have this small little thrust. Let me, let me see if it, it even has inertia. Do I, do I increase in? Yay, welcome Curtis. We're in. This is Moons of Jupiter, and it looks like all the moons of Jupiter are flying at us, and we must destroy all of them. A very lengthy explosion, and there's our high score. We can use F3 to change skill level or keep going. Does it let me... Okay, no, now we have to use the keyboard, so we were going until now. All right, so let's start uh, with F3. I thought we could get away with only using the joystick, but not the whole time. Once you die, you have to come back in. I know it's a good point. I look like more of a space shuttle. I don't look like a triangle like other asteroid variants. But I mean, this is very much asteroids, and we've seen plenty and plenty of these here on the show. At this point, this marks our 45th game that is an asteroids variant, or plays pretty much exactly like asteroids. This doesn't give me the constant speed. Like, usually when I play this and I and I use my thrusters to cross the screen, I just keep increasing speed faster and faster and faster. This one isn't as powerful, I guess. The, the, the ship we're piloting doesn't give us as much. But you can see we have asteroids flying everywhere, or shards of the moons of Jupiter flying everywhere. So control-wise, it is not as fluid as other asteroid games we played. It still w works fairly well, and I am playing on an 8K RAM expansion of the Commodore VIC-20, so you, you would have experienced a little bit of slowdown if you played this on the 3K version. I don't believe you could have played this on the unexpanded VIC-20. But yeah, notice how quick <laughs> I'm, just, I'm whizzing around the screen. Oh, there you go. You saw a little bit of slowdown, but still, this is still very impressive. For the asteroid variants you could play right now on a home computer, it's great. That really rubs the itch if you wanted to play asteroids. I'm already seeing ratings being thrown out. Brian's thrown out two and a half stars so far. All right, going in. Oh, Chiptune, yeah, Mad Planets. All right, so let's go in again with, uh, can we change the skill level? So right now we got skill level three. Looks like we can change it to, that's it. You'll, okay, you only have three difficulty levels. All right, let's go in with F3 to start again. 
Oh my goodness, what happened? It changed <laughs> it changed the whole screen to white this time. Oh, and now we're really getting some slowdown. We've been blowing away plenty of the moons of Jupiter, but we haven't seen a UFO yet. Where's the alien life forms here? Maybe there's no life on Jupiter. On the Commodore VIC-20, we played meteors uh, in 1981. We played satellites and meteorites, which was very well done on the VIC-20. And then the space rocks in August of 1982. Those are three examples of some all right asteroid variants you could play. But this one's going against all the other games you could play on all the home computers. And some of the best of the best out there would be Astro Warriors on the Atari line of home computers in September 1982. Star Maze on the Apple II, which kind of is breaking the boundary of an asteroid game. Star Maze was essentially you're flying around into scrolling levels rather than a fixed screen like traditional asteroids. And then we also had Supernova on the TRS-80 in 1980. And then Appleoids, which instead of shooting asteroids, you shoot little Apple symbols on the Apple II. Asteroid Field as well in 1981. And then Microbes on the TRS-80 color computer. It was a very well done one, 1982. A quadrant 6112 on the Apple II in May 1982. Super Asteroids, which I still contest, was very good for a, a, a way to play asteroids at home. And that was on the Exidy Sorcerer. Now, the Atari Asteroids Aerial you're referring to, I think you're talking about the VCS version. The one that was on the Atari home computer, that, that Asteroids, I thought that was amazing. That was four-player simultaneous Asteroids. And that's another contender for one of the best asteroid-style games you could play right now, along with all the other ones. Now, for the Commodore VIC-20, it's pretty much like you're saying, is this better than satellites and meteorites on the Commodore VIC-20? And I say this is a notch below that. It's not as good as satellites and meteorites if you're wanting the best asteroids variant to play right now on the Commodore VIC-20. So with that, I'll still say this is a well-done game, fun to play, and if you want to play some asteroids on your computer, I'll say three and a half stars of all the games you could play right now on the home computer. So I see over in the chat, we got Curtis with three, Manly saying three and a half as well. So yeah, oh yeah, only if the Vic, that would be a totally different rating too. But I'll still say three and a half stars of all the games so far on all home computers. There you go, Moons of Jupiter. Let's see what is next. We're now going to Japan to play on the very rare Commodore Max machine. So from one Commodore computer to another one that pretty much was only in Japan, this is Music Composer. And with a name like that, you know this is going to be more of an application rather than a game. There's very few games for the Commodore Max machine, so why not just include all of them in our showcase? And there's the box front for mu Music Composer, along with uh, what the Max machine looked like. That keyboard you're looking at is more akin to the Magnavox Odyssey 2's keyboard, the really, really bad membrane uh, keyboard. So an another reason why the Max machine failed. It was essentially paving the way for the Commodore 64, the much better one. There's the cartridge that will pop in. Majority of the games on the Max machine were using cartridge. All right, let's pop it and play Music Composer. This is Andy Finkel, Commodore Business Machines in the beginning of October 1982 on a failed system that we might see again on the Commodore 64. I, I think everything on the Max Machine, we end up seeing on the Commodore 64. All right, so here we go. Pay, hit a key to start. Now, the only reason I'm showing this is it's just like the other one we saw on the Max Machine. Uh, it was uh, where we first heard the SID chip, the, the one that powers all the sound and music on the Commodore 64. And this one will give you another sample of what it's like. Ready, set, go. Ah, beautiful. And this music you're hearing is not really the best that the SID chip can do. We're going to hear some really good stuff on the Commodore 64 later, but this was a program that you could design your own music. So I put this in the same category as like music on the color computer in 1980, Melody Simon on the Interton VC 4000, uh, musician on the Philips Video Pack, and then... Um, the music Max Machine game. So we, we already played a game on the Max Machine that was a music game or an app like this. So uh, of all the games you could play, this is, I'm not even going to call this a game. All it is is an app. So I'm going to say zero stars. <laughs> yeah, way proto chiptune. But honestly, because of a game like Mario Paint, that's why I'm slipping in a few of these, you know, art tools and music tools here on the show. But they're mostly applications, though. We'll be avoiding all the rest, but we're not 
cataloging and talking about every single one that's out there. All right, we're going to stay in Japan as we go on to our next game. But first, let's see what's on the TV. There it is. The new most powerful computer in Japan. Oh, yeah. I would totally be that guy. But I'd be playing games on the system rather than whatever software he was running. There you go. So that was both lines of systems. And this is NEC's line of computers, the NEC PC8801. Now, that commercial was a little bit later. You saw it said Mark II. Here on the show, we're blending or putting together the NEC PC8000 series and the 8800 series. And so far on the show, between those two computers, there's only been four games we've seen. This one is our fifth. Omotesando Adventure in April of 1982, Galactic Wars 1 in June 1982, and Zork 1 and Zork 2. And this one is the next game in the line of computers. We're going to see plenty from this one. This one is Mystery House. Let's check it out and see what it's all about. Starting with the box. Mystery House. We've already seen Mystery House. It was High Res Adventure number one, the flagship graphic adventure game or text adventure game with you know static pictures. And this has nothing to do. It will. It is the same name that we saw on the Apple II by Sierra in May of 1980. And this game looks and plays really similar to that, but it has nothing to do with that. This has this has no correlation with Sierra. It's really like somebody in Japan saw that game. That's how inspirational it was, and decided to make their own game. I know, right? <laughs> Maybe it does, Manly. I, I love it. All right, there you go. So the front of the box is essentially, that's the mystery house we'll be going into. Here's the ad you would have seen in magazines at the time. And if you look over on the right side, that's mystery house for the MZ, Sharp MZ line of computers. And it's possible that this was available in the summer of 1982. But like most games on the that Japanese computer, the Sharp MZ series, there, there's just not much found for it. And so I, I'm referring to this one the NEC PC8801, because that's the one we can play and I can find more artwork for. This right here is the only box of the MZ version. It also was available on the MZ2000 at some time here in 1982. But this is the very first time we've ever seen this mystery house, this certain blend of mystery house. What's really fascinating, though, is in Japan, they're going to have the actual mystery house from Sierra brought over, but it hasn't happened yet. This one beat them to the punch in Japan. All right, so there you go. There's an example of the screenshot. The blue house should be what everyone thinks of when they think of Mystery House. I got an alternate version of it. All right, let's pop it and play some Mystery House. This is by T. Shintai, published by Micro Cabin Corp. in the beginning of October 1982. All right, so we're booting us up our home computer. Oh, I love it. The drawing. It's doing the same thing. It's the blue and red house. That's why it's so mysterious. Oh, man, yeah, drawing all the colors. Love it. That's probably all the sound we'll ever hear. All right, so rough translation. Do we want color? Yes. Yes, we do. We want a color monitor. Now, it's going to go through the story a little bit. I am the most gaijin of gaijins to be showing you this, this game. But it's, it's explaining what all everything is, and you can use uh, kanji or you can use... English. So I'll be typing obviously in English, at least for right now. Here we go. It's time to play an adventure game, the one of the very first, if not the first, graphic adventure game on a Japanese home computer. Look at that. Wow. It was blowing their minds. We've already seen plenty up to this point. So what do you want to do? We want to go north. So I do the wrong one. Oops. Oh, I reset it. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't believe I did that. We'll try it again. At this point, this marks our 82nd graphic adventure game we've played on the show. Not just video games that have a picture while you're typing in commands, but also graphic adventure games that let you move around on the screen, too. Okay, so coming in again, do we want a color monitor? Yes, we do. There we go. And then we have the story. Yep, hit the space key. No, why is it... Oh, man, I think there's a, a, a command that's loose because it keeps resetting my my system. And now third time's the charm for Mystery House. 
think of whenever you were booting this up, if you you did you know pull the plug or power goes out or you have a problem with the game, when it comes up again, you have to wait for all the draw in once again. All right, here we go. Yes, yes, we do. We want the color screen. There we go. I know, that's a good point. I, I don't think this is an official port of uh, Mystery House. This is just someone who saw it and said, let's make a game that's just like Mystery House. I mean, why not, right? All right, so here we go. Now, once you get in the game, this one is very unique out of all the text adventure games we've ever played. The noun and verb you have to type separately. So what I'm going to do is watch, watch how I... Um, once it boots up and we go north, it works with normal commands. You know, north, south, east, and west. Here we go. Now we go in the house. When you want to do anything with action, you have to type the verb first and then the noun. So ready, go type open and then type door and then you can go in. So or open, then enter, and then door and then enter. So you have to separate them, and we've never seen any adventure game that's done this so far across all systems. Maybe it's because we're typing it in English. All right, so let's go ahead and head into the door. Love the drawing. Notice how it's splitting up. The We have the, the drawing the door, and then it opens the door, and then we move through the next room. And all this looks just like High res Adventure number one. Look, there's a memo. Let's take the memo. Take, and then memo. So you got to do take, enter. Memo, enter. And then there's our memo. Translate it as you wish. Hit spacebar. Move back here. Look at that. Yeah, and the perspective is a little bit different than it was with Mystery House. But it's still giving you that pseudo 3D look, right? All right, there you go. So now we can open, again, door. Oh, and you have to do enter in between each one. It opens the door up. And this game plays very differently. This is not a mystery, like a detective mystery, like Mystery House was. Even though it's called Mystery House. So I'm going to go ahead and head north. This one, you are essentially just going to find the treasure in the house and then come back to the, the spot like you were before, like the very classic adventure game. So it's it's not doing the mystery or detective, like try, trying to find who the killer was. And we're the only one in the house. The High Rise Adventure Mystery House had lots of people in it. This one's just us. Make our way to what looks like the living room. Is that a TV? As everything draws in. Man, the bright colors makes me think we're playing on the TRS-80 color computer. All right, so now you can see we're getting close to here. Oh, possibly nebulous. I don't know. M making our way in, drawing in, and then here we want to do... We're going to search and look in the vase, and it actually goes in... Look at that. <laughs> close to the vase. Oh, hello, it's a key. Take, enter, key. Okay, now, this walkthrough that I'm following for this is the one that High Retro Game Lord did, so thanks, High Retro Game Lord, for this one. Most people have the High Res Adventure Mystery House, the, the one by Sierra. This one's a little bit harder to come by, but because this was on Japanese computers, we're going to see this on a lot of others, like uh, the Sharp MZ series. And you can see we're going to open up and then search the rack. Oh, yeah, thanks, Curtis. Not exactly like that. Man, but it's so cool seeing the drawing, the bright colors that are possible on this system. And just imagine that it's it's Japan, and if you played any other text adventure games, you were only used to text. This is like Japan experiencing Mystery House or High Res Adventure by Sierra whenever we played it. All right, let's search the fireplace now. There we go. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, the Roberta Williams collection. I don't think this one's in there because this one isn't official. We'll get our hammer. And so notice that there's a compass in the top right corner, which is a slight quality of life, but it's it's doing what most graphic adventure games have done. And it's it's really taking its 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 inspiration from Mystery House. So this is a rare case that a video game is playing really like Mystery House. So I'm gonna call this a a mystery house variant. It, it, it's the first one of the first times we've seen that. Yeah, the Sierra one is a lot more popular. This one is pretty hard to come by or to play too. The the the, the computer we're playing on is the PC eighty eight hundred series of computers, and this one is actually 
not exactly the same specs you would have had right now in 1982. So what you're seeing this draw in is actually slightly faster than the 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 experience you would have had. Yeah, there we go. Nice. OK, so let's move to the next room. And this concept is, is very new too, uh, moving from screen to screen and then you're mapping out and you can essentially take all the screens and put a piece them together, which is, which is really fun. And if you had played Mystery House and you're really good at it, let's say you travel, you know, from the United States to Japan, you wouldn't be able to play this one because this one is a completely different game. The only way I'm able to make it through or know where to go in this one, you, you'd be wandering quite a bit, it is because of the walkthrough. And also notice that we only had a little bit of sound at the beginning, and from my knowledge, there's no sound anywhere else. It's just the, the bat flying in, and that's all you get. Silence. But you do get bright colors. Since this plays more like the old school adventure game, this is more akin to like playing Colossal Cave. And this marks, marks our 19th game we played that's very similar to the original adventure or Colossal Cave. And people attest this is the very first game in Japan or a text, a text adventure game that included pictures. All right, as we're wandering around, I'm going to go ahead and stop us there. And we'll quit there. So there you go. That is Mystery House, or the Micro Cabin version of Mystery House. Completely different series, completely different part of the world. But this is amazing to see an inspiration of something from the West take place in the East. Now, I also appreciate that a lot of these Japanese computers don't have either the ability to display Japanese text, so we can still type in, like when we played the Omotasando Adventure, we could type in English and the game still responded, like this Mystery House did. But coming up, when, when, the, when the computers were able to display and re respond to Japanese text, uh, we might be having to go through either video or having uh, something else explain how to play the game. All right, so of all the games you can play right now on a home computer, if this was Japan, this would be awesome. This would be like the, me whenever I rated Mis uh, High Res Adventure number one, Mystery House, on the Apple II. But it's currently October 1982, and this has to go against all of them. I'm looking over in the chat. I see mostly threes or averages for what you see for right now, and I got to agree that's about the same. Um, this would be a lot higher if it was only for this computer, obviously, or only in Japan. But since it's going against every other home computer, I'm going to say about three stars. I see, yeah, it's not bad, it's not great, you bet. And then Manly's also thrown out three and a half stars, too. But it's still around the average range, considering all the other games. All the other 82 graphic adventure games. And we now have graphic adventure games with animation, too. So there's a, a lot for it. Yeah, Curtis, I like that score, definitely. All right. So there you go, that's Mystery House, the mysterious, mysterious version of it. Let's press forward and see our next game. We're going next to the Apple II, and this is Nightmare Gallery. Let's check out Nightmare Gallery. Starting with the box. Excellent PC box. Loving the font, and we got a nice Halloween scary horror motif. Mummy's reaching out at us with with ghouls and ghosts and all kinds of stuff. Oh, and nice. The tombstones are the developers. I believe it's yeah, Robert Clardy and Ron Aldrich right there on the front. Awesome. This is Synergistic Software that did this one. This marks their 11th game we've seen by this company. Flip it over the back. Nightmare Gallery is an exciting combination of Ron Aldrich's machine language wizardry and Robert Clardy's game design originality. Now, Robert Clardy, we've already seen him do a few games like Dungeon Campaign, Wilderness Campaign, and then the Odyssey, the Complete App Venture, and the App Venture to Atlantis, which have been groundbreaking graphic adventure games. So I'm curious to see what this one's all about. We're going to be standing up to lots of ghouls and ghosts, too. There's our five and a quarter floppy disk. We're going to pop into play some Nightmare Gallery with an example of a screenshot. We also have the inside manual or sleeve. It only credits, yeah, there's Ron and Robert C. Clardy in there. The forces of darkness have gathered and are attacking. Awesome. So we're going to be fighting against the undead and ghosts, werewolves, vampires, and ghouls. Can you survive a night of terror? Requires Apple II. I don't see anything required for memory, but I'm sure you have to have 48K. That's the use on the Apple II. So we can move our gun left and right, fire the gun. We have shields and pause. So it looks like we're playing an action shooter game. There's the keys 
or the kind of, uh, what everyone's going to be represented as. If they reach you and destroy your revolver, you're dead, and ghosts can't be killed. All right, seems like straight up action game. Let's pop in and play Nightmare Gallery. This is synergistic software in the beginning of October 1982. This marks our 383rd game that's available for the Apple II, or the 333rd game we've played. 383rd game for the Apple II. And this one's only available on the Apple II. You can't get this anywhere else. Nightmare Gallery. Oh, they have a high score table. It's arcade. Love it. All right, let's see if the joystick works for us. Any key to play? It does. Cool, I didn't need to use the keyboard. I got my shield and I got my fire. I can move left and right. It's a classic fixed. <laughs> when they reach the bottom, there's a scream. That's awesome. It's a classic fixed shooter in the vein of Centipede, but there's really no Centipede out here. Oh yeah, it is. I guess the, the, the ghost dropped more of the tombstones. But you gotta make sure you take care of the enemies because if it gets to the bottom, I don't have the freedom to move up, down, and around. Just fire like crazy, and I do have... Oh, the shield doesn't allow me to shoot. If the shield's on... No, turn the shield off, quick! <laughs> you can't shoot with the shield on. Yeah, this plays and responds very similar to Centipede. We have, looks like yeah, I can shoot through tombstones. Paddle controls, if you can tell by the bottom of the screen. But um, re responses, I really don't feel like I have a lot of speed with my paddle control. When I move left and right, yeah, it's just one fixed speed to go back and forth. Oh, <laughs> it does sound kind of like that, Curtis. <laughs> yes, even that banned arcade game might rear its ugly head here on Chronologically Gaming. Blow up the bats too. Yeah, so you have different enemy types. It's Centipede. <laughs> it does sound like the same one now that you mention it. So this one marks the 24th game we played that is just like Centipede or a Centipede variant. And that's across all systems. Here on the Apple II, we've already played a few of them that are really close to this or act like this. And that's uh, Bug Battle, Nightcrawler, Fotar, and Bug Attack. This one's doing the Halloween motif, so it really reminds me of the one we played on the Atari home computer called Haunted Hill just recently. I actually think Haunted Hill is a little bit better than this because sound, sound effects were a little bit better than the Apple II. It also doesn't feel as rewarding because the centipede, <laughs> the scream is good. The, the centipede isn't there uh, giving you the challenge of something you need to take out. This feels more like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to destroy random enemies all over the screen. Oh, Brian, you bet. Yeah, the box was very, very well done. The game itself wouldn't, doesn't match the, the power of it. Oh, there you go. That's what I'm seeing what the chat's talking about. <laughs> Neil Pert has the top score. Man, if only I could beat Neil Pert. The problem is, nobody can beat Mil Neil Pert. The greatest drummer. All right, let's see. Keep going to the left, to the right. Yeah, at this point, it's nothing special because we've seen some very, very good Centipede games that are out there. Um, some of the best you could play right now um, would be games like Mega Legs or Grid Runner. Takes the idea of Centipede and turns it into a, a sci-fi game. Yeah, I have, I have no qualms, though, with the game. It's it's fun, and it's it's, it's centipede-like. It's just, at this point, after seeing so many, it's not doing anything crazy, impressive, or good. I really want to hear the scream one more time. Yeah, I like the rush high score table. That's a nice touch. <laughs> I wonder who is the fan. Or maybe both, uh, Robert C. Clarty and... Um, The other one escapes me right now. All right, so give me give me a good scream, ghost. I'm ready. <laughs> and it kind of cuts off a little bit, too. Oh, it should have been that score. Maybe it was. If it was if it was 2112, that'd be so funny. All right, so a lot of hidden things in this, this game that I love when they slip that in, the developers do. Very nice touch.
So of all the games you can play right now on home computers, this is not a new concept. It is obviously Centipede. I'm looking over in the chat. I see three and a half stars of all the games you can play. It is a well done shooter and a very good and fun game. It's still around the average range. Um, even with Centipede being the fixed shooter going left and right, it, I actually want to bump it up just a little bit because I consider it around the same range as Haunted Hill on the Atari home computer, which we said was four stars. So I'll say three and a half for Nightmare Gallery. Not as good as the front of the box, but but still a, a, a fun game and you'd have a blast right now in 1982 with it. Yeah, so looking over the chat, we're in between three and three and a half stars of all the games so far. That's awesome. All right, it's time to put our video game playing on pause. Thanks for tuning in with me on this grand quest to play every single video game in order of release. We're still in the beginning of October 1982 and we're going to be here for a while. Next time on Chronologically Gaming, we have an educational game you were not expecting and one of the best games you could play right now on your Commodore 64. That's it for today and like I always say, keep your eyes fixed to the east. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.